I want to first acknowledge my ancestors. I want to also acknowledge my, the mentors, the people that first discovered me when I was 18 years of age, in particular Andy Weil, he's my best buddy, and um, Dusty is, is, my, is my love, and to both of them I want to dedicate this lecture. So. Um, I, we, we have 25 minutes to save the world, so I want to jump into this. 10,000 years ago, we were all forest people, and I believe our knowledge of mushrooms 10,000 years ago probably was far greater than it is today. We benefit in, in the United States from having a multi-ethnic society. Our strength is our multi-ethnicity, and the fact that African people who are very mycophilic, and Asian people, and South Americans, and Eastern Europeans, Western Europeans, have brought in their, their, their body intellect of knowledge. And we benefit from that, and uh, we have an amount of momentum right now, ecological momentum, mycological momentum, and this conference is very much a part of that. We live in the southern reaches of the Puget Sound on Skookum Inlet, and there's a, we live right here, and we have a 17-acre farm, 400 feet of waterfront, and when I moved there, they were very concerned about a mushroom farm contaminating the oyster shellfish beds below me, so I installed beds of wood chips, impregnated the wood chips with mycelium, and the coliform bacteria count plummeted down to less than three, uh, three units per million, which was a, a hundredfold decrease in one year. That led to the, my discovery of what I call mycofiltration. Here is a mushroom recently discovered by Dr. Frank Pirano at the University of Wisconsin Medical School. It contains a novel antiviral agent called RC183. It's very effective against a wide variety of viruses. And this mushroom has opened up the door to a whole new frontier of antiviral medicines, specifically revolving around mushrooms. So the mushroom life cycle, two spores come together, they fuse, they form mycelium, mushrooms show up, and then more spores form, and on it goes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, but this is what happens. The mushrooms are the tip of the iceberg. They only show up 1% to 2% of the life cycle. And so here's an old Russula species in the old growth forest, and it's decomposing. And as it decomposes, bacteria grow, and mushrooms are great hosts for a wide number of microorganisms, including bacteria. Spores germinate, and the spores, and then the, as the mycelium disintegrates into the ground, this becomes the resident organism that is underfoot at all times. And I've applied for several patents. This is a patent that I've applied for using spores in chainsaw oil. So when the stumps and trees are cut, the stumps become inoculated with mycelium, and by capillary action, they don't dry out. They become an oasis of life. If you haven't seen it, just go into the woods and just knock over a log, and you'll see the mycelium underneath. It's everywhere. I spent seven years in front of the scanning electron microscope, and my, that's my specialty in, in college. And I have thousands and thousands of electron micrographs. They're exquisitely designed as a microfiltration fabric that catches bacteria and, and other nutrients. The mycelium produces enzymes and acids and antibiotics that conditions the external environment and then breaks down large organic complexes of molecules into simpler forms and then selectively takes those nutrients that it needs. So these are the great soil builders on our planet. These, these are the soil makers. These are, these are the mycomagicians that create the very habitat for vegetables and other plants. And the more that I was staring at this, the more that I realized that over time, this resembles a neural net. 460, 465 million years ago, we shared a common ancestry with fungi. And then we diverged. We share more in common with the genetics of fungi than we do with any other kingdom. And so the more that I started looking at the mycelial networks, the more I began to realize, well, why wouldn't they be intelligent? I believe in the natural intelligence of this planet. And if I learned anything in the past several years, is that precept and that, that, that I have adopted has led me to some astonishing breakthrough discoveries. And this is what I want to share with you. In a single cubic inch of soil, there can be more than a mile of these cells. They're only one cell wide, and yet they, they are extremely pervasive. There are mycelial mosaics that are, that are running underfoot at all times. They're interspersed and they're overlapping. It's the complexity of the fungal genome that uh, gives nature the ability to respond to catastrophia, whether it's from a tornado or hurricane or somebody chipping wood or building a house. These saprophytic fungi in particular are running after us as quickly as we can, trying to repair the damage that we're ca causing in the ecosystem. And we need to recognize them for their inherent power. Um. The largest living organism in the planet is a mycelial mat. It's 2,200 acres, 165 football fields, three feet deep, 2,400 years of age. It's killed the old growth forest four times over 
in Oregon and Washington State where these mats are so extensive. So it begs the question, you know, are parasitic fungi truly blights of the forest, or are forests feeding the carbon cycle of the fungi so they can build soil to then become a pedestal for great ecological diversity? This is a, a neuron. When I look at the mycelium, I see this as a neural net of Gaian consciousness. The ecosystem is tied together with, with infused mass of mycelium, and they share information and knowledge. And, and how they operate in the, in the ecosystem is not clearly understood, but we, knew, we know that they're the reparative organisms in nature. So here is a photograph from nature that shows uh, the organization of the computer internet. It's very mycelial-like in its form. There's no point-specific place where the internet can be totally disrupted. And the mycelial uh, form also follows this archetype. And I present to you the concept that the invention of the computer internet is just an extension of a previously proven biological model that has been, that's been, that's been refined over millions of years of experimentation. And it's no accident that we invented the computer internet at a time a, where we are in crisis, ecologically and politically, so we can share information and create countries without borders. <laughs> So now I'm really going to go out on, on a limb here, and then I'm going to show you some practical applications. <laughs> um, this is a cobweb of dark matter. As many of some of you know, 60, 70 percent of the matter in the universe is unaccounted for until just recently. And dark matter, and th these are galaxies, and, and the, dark, the, str the strings of dark matter also conform to this mycelial-like archetype. And I want to present that I wonder, I have to wonder, that we're, we all become stardust when we die, and are we now looking at the form of universal consciousness? I mean, is this the, this the macro universe, the macro brain? I mean, I have to wonder, because when I look at these different paradigms, they repeat themselves in you know, ever-increasing uh, orders of magnitude, and I think we're onto something here between the microscopic versus the huge macroscopic universe. And then NASA published this, that a Martian meteorite, when broken open, had mushroom-like structures. And we know that amino acids are traveling through the cosmos. We're one step away from amino acids to DNA. And I believe that fungi are resident throughout the universe and on other planets. This is a natural consequence of the existence of matter. Fungi arrive, the computer internet arrives, and in the, in the organization of matter throughout the cosmos conforms to this central archetype. Here's a slime mold that actually navigated through a maze, through four different doors, so to speak, door number one, door number two, door number three, <laughs> uh, door number four, and was able to intelligently navigate through a maze in the most efficient manner, capturing two nutrient sources with the least amount of cellular production, thus proving cellular intelligence. I absolutely believe in this. So Dusty and I, we go into the old growth forest and we find in the ancestral strains of fungi, and this is a, lion, a lion's mane-like mushroom called Herbicium abiatus, and I take that mushroom, I clone it in the laboratory, and by capturing the phenotype, I preserve the strain, and then we grow it. And this is the first fruiting that I know of the species ever being presented. So we're very much into capturing phenotypes, and we just take a tiny little bit of tissue. It's amazing how little that we need. So one of the research experiments was specifically on a mushroom that's the first indicator species for the spotted owl, called Oxyporus nobilismus, and it grows at the base of Abies procera, the noble fir. This mushroom had made the Guinness Book of World Records as being the largest mushroom in the world, and one of the oldest. It lives hundreds of years uh, in the old growth forest and does not rot. And so it presents some very unique characteristics. It's exclusive to Washington and Oregon and British Columbia old growth forest. There's only six or seven locations. So uh, it's a very fuzzy and uh, beguiling uh, mushroom. It's very soft and animalistic. I find myself, you know, stroking this thing. Sort of. <laughs> this is Tremades versicolor, turkey tails, circumpolar, used by native peoples all over the world. The best studied medicinal mushroom, the subject of a, a clinical study in the Lancet, 236 patients with gastric cancer in combination with chemotherapy, 33% increase in survival after five years providing a chemoprotective shield around the healthy cells and chemosensitizing those which are, which are cancerous. There's a tremendous amount of information on this, and this is time for another, another lecture. So we also grow chicken of the woods, which has now been also identified as being a source for some novel antibiotics. This is very interesting to us. Most of you, or many of you, are familiar with these polypore mushrooms. The polypore mushrooms are the ancient ones. All gilled mushrooms evolve from polypores. There are no poisonous polypores. You can boil woodcocks off of trees and make a soup or a tea, and you can live for weeks. 
Uh, so this is just a curiosity of nature that no polypores are yet known to be poisonous. Um, so the Iceman was discovered on the border of Italy and Austria in uh, 1994. And most interestingly to me, the Iceman had with him three polypore mushrooms tethered to his right side. And they had with them Piptoporus betulinus, the birch polypore that you see here. And the birch tree figures very prominently in the ideology of many native peoples. The birch polypore depends upon a beetle that burrows through it and gorges itself with spores and then goes to another tree, burrows in, into the tree, and spreads the spores of the birch polypore. It can also be cut so thin as paper and is extremely flammable. Uh, it has very strong antibiotical properties, and so the Iceman probably was using that for that as well. He also had Fomis fomentarius, which is great because you can hollow this mushroom out, and after it's dried, you can carry fire. Now think about it, 5,000 years ago, if you didn't have fire or the ability to carry fire as our nomadic ancestors traveled, then you would die. So the fire keepers of the tribes were very, very important people, and they developed strategies for carrying embers in mushrooms. And so they not only have antibiotical properties, but these are essential for keeping the tribe alive, so to speak. Now, one of the mushrooms that the Iceman had, Fomis fomentarius here, we found is effective against E. coli 0157. And this is the, this is the mushroom. These are the exudate uh, drops that are coming from the mycelium, and this is E. coli. We're going to look at this edge here. And the mushroom mycelium of Fomis fomentarius, this is unreported, never been seen in science, produces on an osmotic pressure wave a army of crystalline entities. The, I call these messenger crystals. Um, and they go out in advance of the mycelium, and here's the E. coli, and here are the messenger crystals. And as they encounter the messenger crystals, they decompose. And as they decompose, they leave, leave a chemical scent trail. And then as the mycelium advances, it appears that it customizes a secondary crystal, which then becomes strange attractants to the E. coli. There's thousands of E. coli cells that are surrounded one of these macrocrystals stuns them, and then they die. And the mycelium advances directly into the E. coli and consumes that. So we think the Iceman also was eating Fomis fomentarius for its antibacterial properties. He knew that 5,300 years ago, and we, we just, just rediscovered it in, in the past two years. So I think there's a tremendous amount of ancestral knowledge that's, that is, is present out there. One of the other mushrooms that's resident to old growth is Fomitopsis officinalis. This is called agaricon. Dioscorides first described it in 60 AD as a treatment against consumption, otherwise known as tuberculosis. Um, and we cloned this very specimen, just a very small amount of material, and so now we have captured this phenotype. This mushroom species is now extinct in Europe, and so this resident to the old growth forest. The Haida people discovered what also a Dioscorides had discovered in Greece, and they're on the opposite ends of the world and in totally different time spaces, and they discovered that this mushroom is very, very important. I've been working with a company called Battelle Laboratories for several years. They spent $300,000 on testing my strains. And one of my strains breaks down VX and sarin. The core molecule is called DMMP. And it dephosphorylates it in a heretofore unprecedented fashion. Uh, this has got people very excited because it's a very recalcitrant, difficult to break down molecule. And it, it is the core constituent of many of these chemical warfare toxins. And the fact that we were able to break it down in a heretofore unprecedented manner has gotten a, a lot of attention. This mushroom is resident to the old growth forest. And I want to speak directly to President Bush. We should save our old growth forest as a matter of national defense. <laughs> We also were doing work on breaking down hydrocarbons. So this is the oil that's being absorbed into the mycelial mat. And uh, we did a test experiment up in Bellingham, Washington, competing against five different bioremediation companies. Each pile was inoculated or treated, and so the bacteriologists came in with their treatment, and the chemical enzyme people came in with their treatment, et cetera, et cetera. Four or five weeks later, they pulled the tarps back, and the amount of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, uh, was over 10,000 parts per million, about 1%, roughly that which the rec Exxon Valdez spilled on the beaches of Alaska. And uh, we did a series of experiments, and when they came to our pile and pulled back the tarp, you know, in front of all these government officials, there were shrieks of laughter, because our pile was resplendent with oyster mushrooms, and some of the mushrooms were 12 inches in diameter. 
Uh, the mushrooms are totally devoid of any diesel residues whatsoever. The, the, the lignine peroxidases break down lignine, which are long chains of carbon and hydrogen, and severing those carbon-hydrogen bonds is the basis of hydrocarbons, which basically affects all pesticides, PCBs, dioxins, etc. The mycelium are very intelligent at being able to be trained to be target-specific to the, to the contaminant that they need to digest, and we've developed strategies specifically for this. <laughs> So then something re even more remarkable and unexpected occurred. The mushrooms then, as they rotted, first they produced spores, of course, and then flies came, they laid eggs, and then birds came in to eat the larvae they were developing from the eggs. They brought in seeds, and then the bacteria were rotting the mushrooms, and pretty soon our pile became an oasis of life, the only pile that became a rebirth environment of a multiplicity of organisms. And so we think we found a keystone mechanism for habitat restoration using these primary saprophytes specifically for this purpose. So these are three, four, and five ring structures of the PAHs, and it just shows, shows how effective that we're breaking them down. We broke down the PAHs in this experiment to below 200 parts per million from 10,000 in a matter of six to eight weeks, by far beating any other competing technology. But then we told the, the bacteriologists, actually, we agree with you, but we are creating, creating the host for the bacteria. So our technique actually worked, not just because of the mushroom mycelium, but because the whole community of, of subsequent organisms that came into play, so the phytoremediation people, and the bacteriologists and, and the chemical enzyme people also eventually agreed with us because we found something that made their puzzle pieces all fit together. Okay. Now, I really want to blow your mind. <laughs> this is Trimidomyces. Now, African peoples know this better than anybody in the world. It's a delicious edible and choice mushroom. Of the 8 million species of insects that are theorized right now in the current issue of Scientific American, 1.5 million species of fungi, 1,000 species of bacteria, but realize species concepts are very plastic, you know. Um, all insects uh, partner in some fashion or interface with, with fungi. Uh, this is a, a fungus that the ants cultivate, and it's called Trimidomyces. The white ants are called termites in Asia, um, and, uh, or vice versa. And um, they produce this beautiful honeycomb of mycelium in which they live, and then the mushrooms produce, and you can eat the mushrooms. They, they are not disturbed by that at all. Um, but they, they are absolutely dependent upon these fungi, and they've gone into a close collaboration with them. And a mushroom that many of you are familiar with is called cordyceps, and it parasitizes insect larvae, specifically that of the Lepidoptera uh, group, silkworms, etc. And they produce a little fruit body that comes out of the head of the insect. This is weird science. <laughs> Here's an ant, and this, this group of ants actually have this impulse to climb to the very top canopies of trees. And they get to the very top canopy, this, this, they have to climb, they have to climb when they're infected. And they get to the very top canopy of these trees, and <laughs> this thing fruits out of their head. Um, <laughs> And so there's a very close, intimate relationship between insects and fungi, and we're still trying to explore exactly what this means. <laughs> now, we live in an incredibly bad house. Those of you who have visited us, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Dusty and I have, we have beautiful laboratories, but our house is falling down. Um, it's really in bad shape. After the, after the Olympia earthquake, it sank, uh, the roof tilted another two to three inches. The good thing about that, our flat roof now is not flat, and so rain goes off the roof faster. <laughs> But as a friend of mine said, if all the carpenter ants stopped holding hands in your house, it would fall down. <laughs> so I went on the epa.gov homepage, and I looked for fungi that have been approved to be non-toxic to humans and, and mammals and, and target-specific to insects that you want to get rid of. And so to make a long story short, if I can possibly do that, <laughs> is <clears throat> I grew up mycelium, and I believe truly mycelium is intelligent. In our laboratories, we have 10,000 kilos of mycelium that we're growing every week. So you're humbled by it. The mycelium is bigger than you. You better be humbled by it. You'd be stupid if you weren't. But other mycologists are what I call petri dish mycologists, and they have this kind of white male dominating attitude of, of they're in control and the culture's down there. So they, 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 they have developed these strategies of, of spore delivery systems for infecting insects. $50 million has been spent by Monsanto, Dow, all these big corporations in finding ways of developing biological controls using fungi to kill termites and, and other insect pests. But everybody missed something. Everybody in the field of entomology, in the field of mycology, 
and I've had a breakthrough discovery that's absolutely revolutionary. What I discovered, or what nature discovered and I rediscovered, was that the mycelium, prior to four, see, the problem with the spore delivery systems is the insects aren't stupid, they know the plague when they sense it. And so as they come to these bait traps that have spores in it that Dow produces, et cetera, they turn tail and go the other direction. They're, you know, they don't want to become infected, so they use little brushes to brush the insects, but it does not work very well at all. In fact, all bait traps have been now officially declared by several researchers as being totally uh, non-functioning. And so I chose the path of, of selecting out strains that delayed sporulation so I could grow up spawn. So this is at 9.30 at night in June of 1999, and I put out about 50 kernels of rice that has mycelium prior to sporulation. At midnight, my daughter had to go to the restroom. She came by. And, uh, and she, she couldn't believe it. She came into our bedroom and said, Dusty, Paul, wake up, wake up, you gotta see this. And there was 25 carpenter ants that were around this, this, this rice dish. And they took the kernels of rice back up into the house and one week later, no carpenter ants. Now, I talked to my, a good friend of mine, he went to Harvard Law School, and uh, he goes, Paul, you might have a patent here. So he researched it and we have co-authored the, the series of patents now that are absol absolutely revolutionary. We have found, and the patent has been tested at Texas A&M University and um, over the past two years, and here's the most amazing news of all. Not only with microremediation can we break down resident chemical pesticides and other toxic chemicals that are, are held together with this unique hydrocarbon structure, but we have developed a technique and it's been independently tested and verified at Texas A&M University by Dr. Roger Gold, ground zero for termites in the United States, and the results are the following. We're 100% effective against the Formosan termite. We're 100% effective against the Eastern Subterranean termite. We're 98% effective against fire ants. We, we, we have now applied this. Everything that we are applying is working. Prior to sporulation, these fungi have developed attractant properties that are target-specific to the insect that they've evolved to parasitize, beguiling the insect to come closer, come closer, and they, and they ended up gorging themselves with the mycelium, taking the mycelium back into the nest, breaking it up, and they give it to, to the uh, queen, and they give it to the brood, and the workers spread it throughout the entire nest. By disrupting the mycelium and delay sporulation, the whole nest then becomes colonized with mycelium, and then whoop, the entire in insect colony is killed. Now, so we have found what patent attorneys call a breakthrough patent. It's a paradigm shifting patent under which hundreds of other patents can be issued. But we believe literally we can replace all chemical and agricultural pesticides in a totally benign fashion. We seek no war against insects. We seek balance and equilibrium. We want to protect the insect genome from which we can derive these strains. So. We have now, now applied this to uh, a multiplicity of other avenues. Logging roads causes siltation in salmon beds, and the flow of silt in the salmon beds rest restricts the salmon habitat more than anything else. So now we've developed a strategy where we can put wood chips infused with mycopesticidal species of fungi onto logging roads. The mycofiltration catches the silt, but also those are experiencing beetle blights. We can put these, these fungi into the wood chips, and the logging roads can become perimeter barriers preventing insect plagues from sweeping across the forest. I mean, then we can also break the hydrocarbons as well or other pesticides in these environment. You can just let your imagination go wild. We have found a pedestal groundbreaking technology that we can bring all these concepts into one and basically we're gardening with mushroom mycelium. <laughs> the forest community uh, as well as the Park Service has gotten very excited about this because we can preserve and um, we can cause least amount of disturbance in these environments by overlaying it with mushroom mycelium. We can apply this with farms, around communities, and gardens. We can apply it everywhere. At the end of the day, we are making soils. I want to thank all of you. I'm here because of you. So thank you very much.